somebody y'all just shout out you are holy you are holy lord this season of unrest and this season of uncertainty and this season of rioting and protesting and struggle in the land pandemic and injustice it's good to see young people worshiping jesus hallelujah come on pray with me lord we thank you that you are a prayer answering god we thank you that you alone are worthy we come today god because we have a desperate need for you a desperate need to be close to you a desperate need to be drawn to you a desperate need to be in relationship with you god we pray for healing in the land we pray god because you are a god of justice that you would bring forth justice in the land god god we need wisdom and you tell us in the book of james that if we lack it we can ask for it and you will give it to us without any reservation you won't hold back anything that is necessary for our success for our righteousness for our unity and so i pray now god that you by your spirit would speak to us wherever we may be listening to this message wherever we may be watching right now i pray you would speak life to us i pray god for every graduate i pray for all of our young people i pray for our families i pray god that you would remove a spirit of distraction that we might be god able to focus in to hear what your spirit is saying to the church give us now god information inspiration and implementation god save our enemies god heal those god that are that are that are physically sick because of their spiritual and emotional sickness heal bodies god heal minds heal hearts god god draw people to you god heal and deliver save for your namesake in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glad you are worshiping with us this Lord's Day. We have been in a series, and we will be in a series of psalms, and a psalm for every situation. I, I really have been preaching a mini-series out of Psalm 46. Today is going to be my last Sunday in Psalm 46, and I know that there is a temptation on the land uh, to drop your series drop whatever you're going to preach and immediately address issues and riot, the riots and the violence and the looting and the unjust deaths. But if it's all right with y'all, I'm going to just stick to my series because I believe there is a word from the Lord even for this season that comes not from James Galliard and his emotions from the Holy Spirit. What better place to land on this Sunday than Psalm 46 and verse 10? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Say amen if you can can have your seats get comfortable. I want to preach on learning to hit pause. Learning to hit pause. I guess many of us are doing more binge TV watching these days. And if you have direct TV or whatever your cable provider may be, one thing I appreciate about binge watching or even live TV watching is that the advances of the technology give us the opportunity that while I'm in between episodes or even while I'm in the midst of an episode, it gives me the ability to hit the pause button. When I hit the pause button, I'm basically saying, I hope y'all get this in the spirit. I'm basically saying, I need a break before I continue. It, it, it could be a bathroom break. It could be a snack break. 
It could be somebody's called me about a member of the church break. But when I hit pause, stay close. I'm saying I need a break before I continue. I believe prophetically, spiritually, as we unpack Psalm 46, verse 10, the psalmist tells us to be still. That the psalmist is saying sometimes before you move on, you need to take a break before you continue. He's saying to us over and over again that sometimes we think we're ready to move forward, but we're so busy being busy that sometimes I'm going to stay right here till I get help. That sometimes I need to take a break before I continue. Y'all, 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 y'all. A break is built in 74 times in the Bible. 74 times a break is built in. We see 71 of these breaks in the book of Psalms. And not only do we see 71 of these breaks in the book of Psalms and three of these breaks in the book of Habakkuk, but even in Psalm 46 alone, we see three of these built-in breaks. We see it at the end of verse 3. We see it at the end of verse 7. And we see it at the end of verse 11 when we find a word that many of us don't quite understand its origin or what it means. We find the word Selah. Selah is God saying, before you move on, you need to take a break. That sometimes, y'all, this is such a good word, that sometimes the word I just read is so good. I need to take a break to ponder it. I need to take a break to reflect upon it. Now, sometimes that's one of the problems with our devotion life. Our devotion life is so filled with activity. I got to read a scripture. I got to pray. I got to be saying something that it is devoid of segla. It is devoid of me just taking a break before I continue. And, and we don't quite know. We don't quite know what segla means. Because the tre- reality of it is there are three different interpretive perspectives of what Selah means. Stay close. I'm going somewhere. The, the first interpretation of Selah is a musical interpretation. Then you'll see it over and over again when you begin even here in Psalm 46. It says to the choir master. And we see this reference of Selah as it relates. And this is why most of Selah is in the book of Psalms, because Psalms was the hymn book for Israel. This one, see, we read them. They sang them. It it was, this was, the book of Psalms was Israel's red hymn book. Y'all grew up Baptist, y'all know what I'm talking about. It, It was Israel's red hymn book, and they... They would not dare, I might as well go here for all you folks that just got to always have contemporary music all the time. They wouldn't dare show up in God's presence without a hymn. It was so important to them, they wrote them. They would open up their red hymn book and they would sing the Psalms. And as they sang the psalm, the interpretation of Selah is a, it's a musical interlude. In other words, y'all, the, the, the congregation is singing, and then all of a sudden, the choir master gets, the choir master says, Selah. When the choir master says, Selah, immediately the instrumentalists take on like a jazz riff, where they just kind of elevate what's going on, and it takes, a, it takes some worship to a whole nother level. It has a musical interpretation. It, it, y'all, y'all know a riff is when you get that, you know, just a few little notes and you just keep playing them over and over again rhythmically. It's a rhythm of the music. It says, stop singing, Selah, get your jam on, brothers. Selah. It, but it doesn't just have a musical interpretation. So some would argue, stay close, I'm going somewhere, that it has a liturgical interpretation. The the liturgical interpretation of Selah is almost like call and response. You ever know how sometimes I'm preaching and then out of nowhere I just kind of stop talking? And, and, And that's really your chance to say amen. It's your chance to say hallelujah. 
that, that, that the midst of say lies like, whoo, man, God, what God just said is so good. Before I move on to point two, I need to give folks some time to shout over point one. And sometimes, y'all, we so caught up in getting a new word that we haven't even processed the old word I got. And every once in a while, I need to take a moment and take a step back and say, God, let me process what I just heard in these first few verses until I get another word. Say lie. Could have a musical interpretation, could have a liturgical interpretation. But part of that liturgical interpretation is the musicians need a moment. So it's not just shut the mute, shut the voices down so they can jam. The interpretation is also shut the instruments down so we can sing a cappella. So the instrumentalist can take his hand off the harp and lift it up to God. So the instrumentalist can take his hand off the instrument, can take his mouth off the horn and use his mouth as a horn. So the instrumentalist can take his fingers and instead of playing the instrument, let his hands be, let his hands be the instrument. Say la. It, it, but, but I don't want to deal with the liturgical interpretation, or the musical interpretation. I want to deal today with the literary interpretation. The literary interpretation of Selah is it marks a shift in mood. It means there's a new paragraph about to happen. It means there's a transition in thought. It means that there's something going on of underlying importance. And I need to take a moment. Oh, God, this is so good. If you can hear in the spirit right now, I need to take a moment of contemplative pause. Oh, God. Watch this. I need to take a moment of contemplative pause so there can be subsequent praise. <laughs> in other words, if I could just go somewhere, I'm getting ahead of my sermon now. If I could just go somewhere and sit down and shut up and pause. When I come out of that pause, I'm going to have a greater praise than when I went in that pause. Because sometimes you're too darn tired to shout good. You're too tired. You've been running your mouth about everything else. God said, just sit down somewhere. Be still. Some would even argue, <laughs> Stephanie, some would argue that Selah even has a definition, a meaning that some of us don't think about. Because if you think about it, the use, all of these psalms, and only 71 times total, is Selah mentioned. Some suggest that it is really a Sanskrit Philistinian word that while David was hanging out with the Philistines traveling with them, they had a curse word. And the curse word was Selah. And the reason it's so arbitrary in the Psalms it's because every time David was getting his musical genius on and playing his harp, the moment his harp, spring, his harp string broke and he couldn't continue with what he was writing, it was like, Selah. It was like, I, I got to shut up for I curse. Y'all not talking to me. Because some of y'all need to get to a point where you sit down and shut up. Because when you break your harp string, you got to take a moment of self-reflection before you say something you're going to regret. Somebody shout, say lie. Say lie. Um, I, ain't, I ain't got nothing to say to you right now. Say lie. Some of us need to say lie the moment. Mm, preach past again. I'm, I need to learn that because I've been going at some folk lately on Twitter. And I'm going, so this week I made up my mind that when people say something stupid, my response is going to be say lie. My response is say lie because if, if it's not say lie, I'm about to tell you off in a few characters. 
Everybody shout Selah. The Amplified Bible would suggest it means, watch this, to pause and calmly think about it. The, the, the Passion Translation says it means to pause in God's presence. In this series, I've tried to show us God as a refuge. I've tried to show us God as a river. And today, I want to show us God as rest. I want to say three or four things as I unpack this text. It's only one verse. Be still and know that I am God. Here's the first thing I want to lift up. First thing this passage teaches us is we need to hit pause so we can rest. Everybody say, so I can rest. Uh, Verse 10 opens up, be still. Shout that out, type that in, be still. The JDGV interprets it as go somewhere and sit down. Can, can we be honest? <laughs> Haven't you had some few folk where you wanted to look at them and say, will you go somewhere and sit down? This is the Holy Ghost saying to us, go somewhere and sit down. Maybe this is just James Gale, you're being too transparent. But there have been some times when my activity was worse than what created my activity. No, I say what you want. I'm not scared to tell this truth. You can't exchange life for property. There's there's no connecting point between responding to an unjust death and destroying businesses. Matter of fact, can I just go a little bit deeper where I'm going to probably get ran off the internet? I think you need a protest permit. And I think your protest permit needs to be evidence you voted. I, need, I think your protest permit needs to be evidence you participated in the census. Because if you haven't taken the census and have not voted every election, the whole down ballot, including the primaries and the off season, you don't deserve the right to protest. Ooh, we'll have some haters out there, but that's all right. Be still. Go somewhere and sit down. Let me unpack this for a moment. The first reason I hit pause is to rest. Y'all, the interesting thing about Psalm 46 and verse 10 is that it is phrased in the imperative tense, meaning it is not advice. It is not a suggestion. It is not an opinion. It is imperative. It is an order. It is a command. It is an assignment. He is literally saying, watch this. Can I tell you what? Can I tell you what? What be still means? Be still in the Hebrew literally means keep your hands off of it. It literally means turn it loose. It literally means let it go. The idea of be still is one of total and complete yielding of myself to God. It is total surrender. It is absolute submission. You got it. Y'all didn't get it. Y'all forgot it. Y'all forgot it. Y'all forgot the background of Psalm 46. Hezekiah is in war. Sennacherib is surrounding him. He's praying to God. In his praying to God, he recognizes God is going to be so good. He recognizes, Hezekiah does, my leadership quality won't get me out of this. How to win friends and influence people is not going to fix this. My military genius is not going to get me out of this. God then looks over at him and God reminds him, it ain't going to be you that's going to deliver you from the Assyrian enemy. Let me tell you what you need to do. In the midst of your battle, Hezekiah, be still. In the midst of your battle, let go. In the midst of your battle, take your hand off of it. In the midst of your battle, I'll work it out. Is there anybody that can look back over your life and thank God that in the midst of my battle, I learned how to let go and take my hand off of it and 
in the midst of that rest, God gave me victory. Ooh, can, can I tell you what should make you shout? Getting a victory while you've been resting. Y'all need to process that for a minute. Some of y'all are so tired of fighting that if God gave you the victory, you couldn't even enjoy the victory because you're too tired of fighting for the victory. God is saying, be still and take some rest. I need to hit pause so I can rest. But there's a second thing, Audrey. The second thing, family, is that I don't just hit pause to rest. I need to hit pause to reflect. This is going to get really convicting. I'm still in verse 10. Be still. Take your hand off of it. Let it go. Total surrender to me. Rest in it. Be still. Watch this. Now watch the reflection. And know that I am God. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, y'all, y'all, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. God says, some of y'all think the only way you can know me is by studying about me. See, it's a whole bunch of folk with a great devotional life that don't know God. Y- y'all didn't catch it. You <laughs> hope y'all ready for this. He, he does not say, come on, Bible readers. He does not say, be still and it shall be known. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, be still and know about. Y'all not reading the Bible with me. It does not say, be still and get to know. It says, be still and know. Why does that matter? Because he is teaching us. He is implying to us that in order for us to know God, it is connected with my ability to keep my hands off of some stuff. <laughs> see, some of us don't have the personal revelation. Everybody say personal revelation. You, see, this issue of, of reflection is an issue of knowing God personally. It's an issue of knowing I've watched God work. I know who God is. Not just because I have a prayer life and a devotion life, but I've been able to rest in him while he worked on my behalf and battled for my behalf. And I've learned in the midst of my fight and in the midst of my battle, while I was resting, I learned. Now, let me, I got to unpack this. Because this is really convicting for me. That I thought knowing God was grounded in my activity. Now, Psalm 46 says, no, knowing God is grounded in your inactivity. It's, it's see, y'all so busy being busy that I don't realize this is going to be, it's, Holy Ghost, let me say it so we can grab it as a congregation. Be still and know that I am God is not written to the children of Israel. It is not written to the nation of Israel. It is written to Hezekiah. What God is saying is you won't get the personal revelation of me that you need while you're being busy. You're going to get a personal revelation of me. You got to sit down somewhere. Watch this. It's a matter of my heart. Everybody say my heart. Let me say, this thing is blowing my mind because I got so convicted by this. And some of y'all not going to want to hear me preach after I say this, but I'm just going to be honest and own my stuff. In the midst of pandemic, I've been busy. As a matter of fact, I've been busier than I've ever been. I've been busy reading adaptive leadership. I've been busy reading justice. I've been busy reading new forms of communication. I've been busy reading styles of transformation. And in the midst of that, I've got good strategy. But God is saying, what's going to get you through this season is not good strategy. What's going to get you through this season is knowing me personally, having a revelation of who God is. It's a heart issue. And i got to get to a point, oh God, I feel the Holy Ghost. i got to get to a point where in my ministry, 
I'm not consuming myself with how to be a better preacher or a better instrumentalist or a better musician or a better student. But if I'm going to get better, I got to take a step back and I got to push those books alongside and I got to close everything else up and I got to take a moment and be still and know that he's God. See, see, y'all, y'all, put your hands on yourself and say, it might be possible that my heart was wrong. Oh, I know y'all don't like that. It could be possible that my heart was about strategy. My heart was about money. My heart was about stuff. And my heart was not about spiritual things and sacred things and sovereign things. If you could just be still and know. I... I've been praying hard lately, right? And I was like, God, I don't know what to do. Do I protest? Do I boycott? How do I combat the narrative of black folk playing the race card? What is my response in this season? What are you calling me to do as a leader? So I closed up all the books on all this leadership stuff. And literally just out of nowhere, the Lord just started speaking to me. And he says, I want, to, I want to reveal myself personally to people. And God threw something at me that just blew my mind. He said, son, let me ask you a question. How can a people be playing against a stacked deck for 450 years and they be the ones of being accused of playing the race card? I move on, I move on. See... It's a heart issue. Now watch this. I'm not done yet. It's not just a matter of the heart to know God personally. But watch this. It is a matter of my hunger. See, what are we really hungering for? If we be honest, y'all, we have people in the church that are more concerned with church budgets and church buildings and church business and church bills, church belongings and traditions and title and time, that they spend more time hungering for those things than they do for God himself. And I'm trying to encourage the people of God that we are entering into a season where I can't hunger after things that are superficial and are things that are temporary, but I've got to hunger after the what of God and the how of God and the when of God. I've got to develop God in a personal way. I gotta reflect. And I can't reflect unless I hit pause. I need to pause and reflect on God personally. But there's another thing here, y'all. I hope y'all okay with me preaching a little longer today. I just, I just want to get this thing out and through us. It's not just hitting pause to reflect on God personally. But I need to hit pause to reflect on God providing for me. Whew. Let me park here for just a moment, y'all. When you take a moment and hit pause and just reflect on how God has provided. See, you can be so busy. I, I've been praying for this. Y'all, Sunday is a great day to step back. Look at life and how God has blessed you over the last six days. I don't care what, how bad it could have been. When you take a step back and look at the last six days, you would have to confess that God is still providing for me. And then I developed a First Thessalonians spirit in everything, give thanks. Uh, Ephesians 5 spirit, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord. In other words, y'all, y'all, when we take a moment to rest, it is a declaration. God, this is so good. It is a declaration that God is the one that's providing. Y'all didn't catch it. See, let me help you for a moment. If you insist on working seven days a week, let me tell you why you're really working seven days a week. Because you've not come to grips with the fact that it's not your job providing for you. Once you recognize, I'm not helping me survive. 
I'm not the reason that my bills are paid. I'm not the reason. God is the reason. I wish I had a handful of people that were virtually watching this that could declare to yourself that when I take a moment of rest, it is my way of making a statement that God is the one, not my company, not my ability. God is the one that is providing for me. God, it, y'all, the church will be fine without the pastor for a week unless I'm the one keeping it open. I, oh, y'all hope y'all, y'all can't handle this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Whatever your gift is, we'll be fine without you. I need y'all need to process it. It's somebody else to preach. It's somebody else to play. We can do a cappella if we have to. Y'all not talking. I mean, it, and I, I'm not minimizing giftedness. What I'm saying is if you don't take off because you think it's going to fall apart, then you are already making a statement that you think it rests on you. And I'm here to kill that demon. God is the one that is providing. And when you hit the pause button, you can reflect on the fact that God is providing. When you hit pause, it's so I can rest. When you hit pause, it's so I can reflect. I'm not done yet. When you hit pause, it's so that I can reverence God. I'm, I'm just right. I'm just right in this few words. I'm writing these few words, Lenny. Be still, shout rest, and know, shout reflect, right? Watch this, that I'm God. Watch this. Now he goes in, I, uh-oh, who? Wait, I will be exalted. You didn't catch it. Hezekiah, not you. I mean, can y'all be honest with me? Can y'all really be honest with me? Some of y'all been in church your whole life, can quote Psalm 46 parts of it, but how many of you honestly know it was for Hezekiah? Let me tell you the object lesson in it. The object lesson in it, it wasn't for him to be exalted. It was for God to be exalted. See, when you hit pause, it is to reverence God. It is to let folk know that God is the one that is worthy of worship. Somebody shout, he's worthy of worship. <laughs> see, see, this, that, that's why we show up on Sunday. That's why whether we're in a sanctuary or a living room or watch, listening to a radio or looking at an iPhone right now, the reason we do it is a way of saying, I know who my worship belongs to. And if I can't worship him in a room, I'll worship him in the street. And if I can't worship him in the street, I'll worship him in the hospital. And if I can't worship him in a hospital, I'll worship him while I'm walking. But whatever I need to do, I'm clear about who is exalted in this season. Y'all, it, it's, it's, it's a reminder that God is the one that's worthy to be reverenced. Um, there were some coal mines in Pennsylvania. And early days of coal mines, they would use mules and donkeys. And as you know, coal mines are dark. I mean, severely dark. And you would go past the coal mines. And going past the coal mines, you would find entire flocks of mules and donkeys grazing on the outside. It's like, I thought the donkey belonged in the mine where it was pitch black. The owner of the mine said, once a week, <laughs> y'all missed it, <clears throat> once a week, we bring the mule out of the mine so we won't go blind. I don't know about you, whether I'm going to be in a church service or watching online, once a week, I'm coming out of the darkness 
to keep myself from going blind. I wish I had somebody that could testify. The reason I'm looking at a TV right now is because I don't want to go blind. The reason I'm listening to the radio right now is because I don't want to go blind. The reason I'm on Facebook right now is because I don't want to go blind. The reason I'm on Twitter right now is because I, I wish I had help. The reason I'm on the church page is because I don't want to go blind. I'm going to spend six days dealing with that mess, but on the seventh day, I'm going to worship God because I I'm going to take a moment to hit pause to reverence him. Somebody shout, this is keeping me from going blind. I, God is the one, y'all. Y'all, I, I, when I hit pause, I hit pause, I'm almost done to rest. I hit pause. You, you young people, get me a, a selection ready. I hit pause to rest. I hit pause to reflect. And I hit pause to reverence. And I'm done. Here's the last thing. The last thing is I hit pause so I can reorder my life. I will be exalted. Watch this. Among the nations, he goes deeper. I will be exalted in the earth. I'm going to help you reorder your sense of priority. I'm going to help you understand Watch this. Oh, God. How many times in your life have, have there ever been a time we've heard the term essential more than now? We, we've never really, we don't even look at things. This is so good. Thank you, Holy Ghost. We don't even look at things from the perspective of essential and non-essential until now. And God is saying, I want you to hit pause so you can determine what's essential and what's non-essential. Because I'm the one that's going to be exalted. Oh, God. Not your pastor. Not your congregation. Not your church. Can I tell you the fact that I love the fact that I don't know of a single church, a single nonprofit, a single faith-based organization that has the capacity and the ability in this season to do it by themselves. And God is saying... If there was ever a time before now that someone or something else was exalted, I'm fixing that. And among the nations and among the earth, I alone am going to be exalted because you hitting the pause is going to enable you to reorder your life. Y'all, I think summer's not till June 20th. How about we do this? I'm almost done preaching. How about we go ahead and do some spring cleaning? Type in, jot down, put in your spirit, purge, purge. And if I'm going to reorder, that means I have to only say yes to what God wants in my life. And to only say yes to who God wants in my life. I'm going deeper. If I'm going to reorder, I have to learn to say no to what God is not telling me to do. Can everybody just shout out, say it? Type it in. Just say no, no, no. Can you get it in your spirit? You can't say yes to everything. Reorder some stuff. Can I tell you what? Too many of us have exalted our busyness. I have made an idol out of how busy my schedule is. So I got to do everything. I got to do every project. I got to hang out with everything. I got to go to every church service. Can I, can I? Can I help y'all for a moment? Some of y'all know I'm about to be finished preaching, right? And, and before the announcements run real good, you're going to click on some other church. And then he or she going to go off, you're going to click on somebody else. And God is saying, why don't you stop hungering for another service and start hungering for the sovereign and just hit pause and be still and know that I'm God. <sighs> But I'm busy. I, girl, I, I, girl, I watch 11 services Sunday. As if they're, and you still mean as hell. And you still don't act like you say, I'm sorry, I know I'm on the internet. What the heck? Mm -hmm. I, and you still don't act saved. Because watch this. Knowing God is not about busyness. Be still and know that I'm God. Hit pause and reorder. Purge. 
Say yes to what God is saying yes to. Say no to what God is saying no to. I'm, I'm done. You know, deal with your stress. You, you do realize God is not the cause of your stress. Do you realize that? Do you realize the best shot I've got to de-stress is to hang out with God? The cause of my stress is people. Yo. <laughs> Can, I think, can, we, can we unpack this for just a moment? The cause of your stress is people and you insist on keep adding more. <laughs> How about I'm don't just be still and no. Cause of my stress is I have another thing on my to-do list. Cause of my stress is I got to feel like I got to be the answer to everything. Can I tell you that I'm, I'm almost done? Can I tell you the blessing of be still and know that I am God? Can I tell you the first thing that should hit your spirit? If I could be still and know that he is God, it immediately resonates in my spirit that I am not. You, okay, I need to say it for you. Y'all missed it. If you can be still and know that you are God, it is evident, know that he is God, it is evidence that you are not God. Pastor, how come you don't have something to say about everything? Because I'm not God. How come you don't always have a response? Because I'm not God. How come you're not always trying to make people feel better? Because I'm not God. Y'all, y'all, do you know what it would do if you would take the S off your chest and you recognize you don't always have to have an answer? Be still and know that he is God. I don't always have to have a rebuttal. Be still and know that he is God. Some of you are going to be very offended by this. I'm not, I'm not participating in no protest. I'm not going out nowhere. I ain't marching nowhere. I am going to say this to you. I might have the potential to fix something better by being still than being active. Be still and know that I am God. I'm done preaching. 